This is gonna be how to level up your painting. Sometimes you can picture something, but you can't always, that doesn't always translate down your arm onto the end of a brush, does it? And you actually consciously practice that. Over the course of a few weeks, you will see massive gains. It was kind of like starting again. There is a massive difference between what I'm painting now to what I even to what I was painting six months ago. The jump was was mega. And then then you reached that point where you just switched and went. So we have a very special guest on the podcast this week. Someone internal in the business. We have Paul from Packing and Stores. Well, uh, not just internal, an uh, integral part yeah, of uh, the business. Integral, inter one hundred percent integral. <laughs> I like. I should have. I should have led that one. A bit All more. things throw, integral, flow internal, me, so. whichever terminology you would like. Yeah, it's, Joe couldn't be here this week because he's getting a, another haircut. Another haircut. Episode. Yeah, <laughs> yeah a new haircut. So yeah, unfortunately. So so yeah. Yeah. So I'm his stand-in for a while. I wouldn't say stand-in. We've been, we've actually been talking about getting you on for quite some time. So. I've just been allowed out of the back room. <laughs> <laughs> just for a brief moment. Don't, don't push it, Paul. No, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Go on back to your cave with words like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, good. But no, so it, we thought it'd be really good to get you on, Paul, because um, just obviously you've been here for quite some time. Uh, and uh, for anyone that's watching this that's had a project by us or had any merchandise or anything mm. at all, it's in Paul's trusted care. With my hands all over it. Yeah, to, make, <laughs> <laughs> to make sure that it gets you uh, perfectly safe and sound. So Paul is the, the the man with the massive, massive task of making sure that everything goes out of the studio as best as physically possible and arrives as, as well as well packaged as we can to make sure that you... That's you, the goal, you know, isn't that it? That is the absolute goal always. Yeah. But from my point of view, I feel like I am keeping this locomotive of Seed Studio <laughs> <laughs> moving forward at all times. So. It, 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 that, like... All jokes aside, it is hugely important. So, like, and I always, always say that, like, it, we could spend hours and hours on miniatures, you know, and, and all these things, but the, the, the receipt of it is just as important as, as the paint yeah, job, sure. you know. So, it's no good if you get it as a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, we don't, we're, not, we're never <laughs> going to do that either. So, so yeah, that's not something we're looking to do. So, yeah. Uh, should we crack on with, there's quite a few uh, reveals in the last week or 10 days been. or so. Mm. Yeah, they have uh, Let's go through some of these. The first one we've got is the Crute Lone Spears. So... I did not even see this coming. This I, I thought they were going to do crew talks. I thought they were going to do obviously a redo of the warriors. Um, I, I didn't realize they'd do more animals that they would be riding. So I think they're really cool. The, the idea behind the, the 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 spear with a bomb on the end is amazing. Mm. Um, so yeah, I thought they. Were, I thought I'm they were, not gonna lie. I literally only just now I've noticed that it's got a bomb on the end of it. That is. <laughs> It's the whole point. Right. It's the whole point of the, of the long spear, George. Well, in fairness, I was distracted by the uh, the steed itself. Yeah, it is, uh, it's pretty. I love the way they're described as chameleon yeah. as well. So that gives you the freedom then to paint them any color you like. You can go absolutely bonkers so, on them. It's really cool. Or uh, I guess you could do some multicolor sort of a uh, camo situation yeah. going on so there. Everyone will be looking up chameleons and seeing what colors and patterns they can. I can paint on those. And you really can use real life reference on them as well to, to, yeah. to, to emphasize them. Or you can go completely crazy and do just nice, insane color combinations you could think of. But um, but yeah, no, they look amazing. I thought it was really good to add, to really pad out the crew range. I think we said this when we spoke about the other releases, like seeing more things coming for that for that faction is just is just really good. And I'm quite happy that there's crew. I always fancied like playing crew more than the towel. Really? Yeah. I just like the models more and now they're getting a bit of extra love. It's just great. So I'm actually quite keen to paint a couple of crew, not because I want to build an army of them, just because, you know, I think they look... That's how it starts. Paul. Good models. <laughs> yeah, but I, that that's before. how it We've starts. That before the show. <laughs> <laughs> that's how it starts. I shouldn't have painted that Dante a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> Yeah, let's not let's go, go down that road. <laughs> yeah, I think Joe will be quite livid if we start with the Blood Angels I, talk I, already. I, so I, into that yeah. I have actually got a box of um, Dark Angels Terminators at home oh, as well. Oh, Joe will be so, happy then. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're playing both sides of the fence, <laughs> Paul. You're keeping it. Right. I don't play any side of the fence. So I just if I see something I like painting, I'll do that. Good. Part, I'll pass the torch down to Paul. You can yeah. sit on the fence <laughs> now. Yeah, yeah. Joe is going to get someone else to paint dark ages in the building somehow. Anyway, so so yeah. No, back on the back on the croup. Uh, was there quite a lot of stuff for croup back in the day then? Because in my time in the hobby, there's never really been much going on. Not really. There was croup warriors, wasn't there? There was the warriors croup. and shaper. I think you had the the, the shaper. Was the croup tox as well? Yeah, like there the were croup tox. Yeah, so yeah. there wasn't much, was there? Wasn't they much. weren't really a. They weren't given much of a thought, really. No, because they were kind of like an auxiliary faction. So, like they, mm. they just because on the Tau sort of background, they, they uh, like sort of like encompass other races to yeah. do different things, don't they? There's those. Um, I remember the. They haven't done new models of them. Uh, hopefully, they might. But um, Vespid Stingwings. Do you remember the flying yes. ones? They they had like the yes. really good guns, apparently. But um, 
But uh, yeah, I mean, it's good to see that they're creating again a full, full sort of like range. And I think if they were going to be a bit more of their own standalone army now, that they're going to be adding a lot more to them anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be good. Yeah, I'm so sure when, we've not seen the last of the releases. No, I don't. I think you'll probably see more. Hopefully, like fingers crossed. Um, yeah, I think there'll be. Hopefully, there's more to come. So yeah, yeah. quite a good sign as well that this is sort of off the back of them just showing off a load of new stuff. Yeah, yeah. To be when they show like stuff in rapid succession, you kind of get the feeling. That yeah, it's almost a few more bits. It's it's almost like when the the sisters army was released, they were they were constantly doing mm. new stuff like for sisters. Now I don't I don't know whether the crew range is going to be as big as sisters, but but um but yeah like it was the way they're releasing stuff it's very it really reminded me of the consistency of when they were releasing stuff for sisters of battle when they were redone um hmm. so yeah hopefully cool. fingers crossed uh next up we've got the new multi-part terminator captain one that i'm uh quite excited for actually do you like this one yeah well it's just nice that it's got like its own new kit that's multi-part i don't know does it is it is it i haven't looked I'm, i've seen a picture of it but i don't know any of the details about options or things like that so do, is it just sword and storm bolter or do you get uh so you've got a couple of combi i'm not just gonna rattle them off the top of my head there's a there's a couple of combi weapons you've got the fist you've got the power sword as well the tablet is optional like it is on the new captain as oh well. wow awesome. so there's like a one with like the sheath for the sword mm. as well um and they painted one as a uh iron hands as well Oh, wow. Mm, awesome. Yeah. 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 No, that, yeah. I mean, the, the, the new Terminator kit is phenomenal. Like, it's such a good kit. Um, so to get, I like the what the one, the Terminator Captain that's in, in the Leviathan box. But, I think this is mm. to sort of be its own standalone version yeah. of that. Because yeah. this came alongside with individual releases of the Leviathan stuff. But instead of doing that Terminator Captain, they've done this one. Yeah. I, do you know what? I, I think this is one model which I haven't really seen much of. Hmm. Like, so I think we saw one picture of it. And I'm then, glad you said that because I feel like they really slipped this one under the radar. It yeah, was just like, it was on the Warhammer community article, but there was no like mention of it elsewhere in the email or no. I didn't see much of it online. Yeah. It was just like, oh, and here's this, by the way. I'm like, oh, okay. It's yeah, it's, cool. it wasn't, it's like, it's it's not like a normal mar Marine release. I don't think like normally they, they you see it, I see it quite a few different places, but I think we've had so many, maybe it's because we've had so many Terminators come out. And so Possibly, many bits, but, but it was like they, they mm. went, oh, here's all the stuff from Leviathan available on its own. And here's mm. a new Terminator captain, by the way. I was just like, well, it's just, it's, is it just another Terminator captain? Once you've seen one, you've probably seen them all. But I guess, unlike the Leviathan set, it's not a push fit thing, which is win in, yeah. its, own, in its own right. So. I hope that this is sort of a sign of things to come because they gave us with the most recent captain, like some uh, aesthetic options like the tablet on the front. So I hope that, because we kind of went away from multi-part, didn't we? With yeah. like all the primary stuff and we're in this sort of middle ground now where it's like- Kind of multi-part, kind of, multi kind of, kind of yeah. not. But I hope that this is sort of a sign of more things to come. Because I think as well with the um, the Terminator Chaplain, there's loads of options in that kit. Yeah, well. there is. Yeah. I think it's been a while since primary stuff has had like proper options in the box. Yeah, it's, I mean, do you know, the thing is you could, with, with Primaris, it's like, it makes perfect sense the way things were done because- Obviously, you've got to have one thing that fits the mold for all the chapters when they first yeah. get redone. So obviously, that's taken several years or so since they released. I don't know the exact time frame. I think it's about seven or so years. Correct me in the comments. It's not far wrong. off that. You're yeah, I think. Close enough, yeah. But but it's it's now, like with things like with the Dark Angel release and seeing all the stuff that's done there with like the upgrade sprue. I think we mentioned it in another episode. But um, it's, it's really exciting because now you're starting to see like the amount of flavor and stuff that you can do to, to, to Primaris as well, which is great. And that captain is a, is a good example of it. I'll have to have a look at the kit a bit more in depth because it is literally one that's come completely under the radar. I've seen a picture of it once or twice, and then yeah. obviously we, we can talk about it. But um, but yeah, so it's, it'll be interesting to find out a bit more about it. I did notice that like, checking their, their pre-order website, I didn't notice that they had a picture of the sprue. So they had pictures of everything else, but there wasn't a picture of the, like the, yeah, bare, that as well. the naked sprue yeah. for, for this for some reason so yeah, yeah i mean that's the thing that's that's why i, I, I didn't even know what, what options it comes mm. to it because i was like i haven't seen normally you look at the sprint yeah if you look on yeah. gw's site then it tells you in the description and there's a photo of one of the other ones that the heavy metal team did but uh yeah yeah okay uh last one we've got on the list is is it endrid ha oh boy mm. oh boy <laughs> what what well I'm you'll not... have to fill me in on this because i'm not familiar with this character so i'm not familiar with the character at all whatsoever so a great start but what i would say is that um that's all i know is that he is um uh, from the Shattered Legions in 30k, so he is a Marine that I don't know. I don't know the, the, the chapter. I think, uh, sorry, Legion. I think he's a, a World Eater or a Warhound. Former I think. World Former Eater. I think. World Eater. Yeah. Um, but for me, when I first saw it, the thing that was most interesting to me is that the Ceramite power armor is modelled correctly mm. as how it would actually be damaged as well. 
Um, there's a massive, massive thing with like ceramite and a lot of people are assuming that it's just like solid metal. It's, it's the tricks in the name, obviously ceramite is ceramic. So when it damages, it's designed to absorb heat and, uh, and, and, and energy and just shatter, which is really cool when you look at the power armor that's on him it's like broken as like how masonry and how concrete would be you can sort of see the, the structure underneath yeah you can see the, 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 the plating so that's uh, immediately it sort of stands out so they're actually modeling the battle damage on there yeah it's it's, um, it's great it's really cool like mm. i think from a painting uh project it's really good because that you actually obviously when you paint power armor, we've all you know we've got we've, i'm sure a lot, all of us have painted base marines at some point in our lives so whether you're watching this or us here like but being able to, to kind of see what's behind that armor, like underneath mm. it, and actually add interest to it in painting is, is is something that that model gives you a real opportunity to to do that. Um, yeah, the size as well is quite interesting because he's actually, uh, and I had to find out a bit about him, but he's actually a big spike. Like he was a big human before he was genetically engineered or, or sort of adapted. Um, so that's why he is like- He's super, super human. He's super, mm. super human. Yeah, so he's almost like, I, I'm going to say this and correct me if I'm wrong. Anyone who's super into heresy, please put comments below. Obviously, detail a bit more about him because I'd love to find out more. Um, but he's almost like Primaris size, but in 30k, which is quite interesting when you look at the like the physical size of him. Um, yeah, I forget that the law changed for the Primaris because I'm not super into it as well because they they got bigger like in universe, right? Yeah, I th I, mm. well, yeah, yeah. Obviously, like Belisarius calls. It's not just that the models are bigger. No, like, no, they're no, supposed no. to be bigger, yeah, right? Yeah, they are yeah. supposed yeah. to be bigger. Yeah, yeah. It's like cool. cool with Belisarius called on a whole like secretive project to create them, but um, but uh, but yeah, that model is is really cool. The pose is amazing as well. Like the charging aggressive, like a typical sort of like world eater kind of like aggressive like pose as well. Um, so yeah, wasn't there like the tagline that he, he actually punches the heads off of world eaters, <laughs> yeah. doesn't he? he? Just runs around punching their heads off. He's got that massive, massive yeah. fist as well, which is awesome. Um, but it's, yeah, really, great really model. Ama amazing. What do you think when you saw it? Yeah, it's cool. It's cool. I like. The, I didn't like know much about it. I guess I didn't really notice what you said until you kind of pointed out. I, I guess I didn't really like put the dots together. I noticed that all the armor was warm, but I didn't think about it from like a law implication of like how the <laughs> so armor was made. Think of that deep, it, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's no, it's, it is really cool. It's cool as well to see the like shattered legions from Heresy like getting some new official stuff as well. Yeah, I'm hoping because one of the characters that I know from Shattered Legions is Medusan, um, and it's a character that I really, really do like. Um, and I'm hoping, fingers crossed, uh, that we hopefully in the future at some point it gives me like a little bit of hope that we might get a Medusan model, which would be amazing. So, mm. so yeah, yeah, sweet. Uh, should we do a little hobby updates, James? I'm sure you've got some escapades from the uh, the Mordian Iron Guard army, whatever they are. Tank building is done. Like, I have enough tanks. Like, I don't need any more. So, what's the the limit now that you've set yourself? Well, have, you, I, have you seen the video, Paul, of his tank? I haven't, but uh, I know he's. He, I think last time he, he told me he had 33, wasn't it? This so yeah, so th th just a bit of an explanation. I'm going to put this on screen for the <laughs> listeners. It is mental a how many he's gotten carried away and no one has been there to stop him and this is what happens this is what happens right two two things one i've been one so one i've been wanting to do a steel legion army for a long time and i started building up tanks for that army adam in office then painted this amazing steel legion army i thought well, well i can't really do better than that and i don't really want to do an, another steel legion army in the in in the, in the office so i was like i'm going to pick go back to my childhood and pick the first imperial guard model i painted which was a Mordian, which is where it started from <laughs> But then what happened is I, I all the tanks that I'd got for my Steel Legion were ones which I, I like collected for years, like all this all these tanks just to literally get them all together. And then I was like, right, well, I'm, if I do want to do Steel Legion in the future, I don't want to disturb all those things that I've picked. So I need to buy my own tank pool of tanks for the Mordians. So yeah, it has gone a bit crazy. I'm not what's, what's the count? I don't know. Yeah, but like have a. No, an but I actually guess. don't. Know. I actually don't know. Like, I actually don't know. I, I think about twenty percent of all packages. I've just, I've just. It was, more than, the it was more than fifteen last you told it me. It was more than fifteen. Yeah, yeah, I literally just, I literally just look on eBay for really cheap Lehman Russes or like tanks that are like I, I think would fit really what well. What did you call them the other week? Banger Russ. Banger Russ. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I did actually send you a picture of some other ones on eBay which are even worse condition. I didn't get those, so, so yeah. So I think I, I, I lucked out, but um. But yeah, no. Um, so all I've been doing really is just I've, I've painted. I actually painted the. I finished painting the f first ever Mordian infantry model for the army, and I chose to paint 
the remake of my very first, it's the second model I ever painted, my very first Morley Nine Guard model. I painted a like-for-like -like version of that, exactly the same. Was that like the original one? That you yeah, had yeah, there? that's the original one. That's crazy one. that you yeah. still have that. Yeah, well, I kept it, yeah. Yeah, I 100% kept it. It's like, not It's not that I wouldn't expect you to keep it, it's that I wouldn't expect you to think to keep it, you get what I mean? I, like, you know, probably, at some point in the future, I'm going to redo this album. That was never yeah. a thought, but what... what, what, what tends, it, over the years, stuff tends to get at least like lost or misplaced, yeah. doesn't it? It does, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I had a box of... Uh, that I kept in the loft of all my uh, old Warhammer from my, from my childhood, and it was obviously it was nowhere near the tank collection I've got now. But um, but basically, <laughs> basically, uh, I, I had in there like my first Blood Angel, my first, and I and I a Blood Angel was the first model I ever painted, and then Mordy and Iron Guard was the next model I painted, and I done some orcs after that, and um, and uh, yeah, so I just pulled out the loft, found it, and I was like, oh, there's the first Mordian from Army, thinking about stripping it, and then I was, and then. Lots of people are like no, don't strip it. Reem, I was like no, don't strip it because it's like it's like your childhood painting. Don't don't. That's some, like a sentimental thing. I was like no, I want to strip mm. the paint. Look how crap it looks. But like, <laughs> <laughs> but like, just, so I literally had to remake the model again because um, I cut the gun off and put a bolt pistol on it again. And then yeah, just re, just just literally I, that's the first one I've done. But it was really nice to actually when I finished painting to have them side by side and be like. Well, that's 28 years later and... Looks no different. It looks no different, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, It looks so different, yeah. Yeah, so, and then... I, and then, yeah. oh, I still I got it. Still got it, yeah. Not progressed not, at all. Not progressed at all, yeah, no. But, so, yeah, it's just nice to, to see, like, the like the t same model, same canvas, but just massive time difference between them. And, um, and then, yeah, now, so now I'm just working through my infantry. So I started on the tanks, um, painted the tank commander and then I'm just literally going to paint the rest of the tank but yeah I'm, I'm going to hit the infantry hard soon so I'm, I'm literally going to paint all I'm going to paint all six, six ten man squads at the same time that's what I'm going to do I'm going to batch paint all 60 of them at current mm -hmm. how many finished models do you have for the army tank commander counts as half a model yeah it's it's just upper half I'll be charitable and say yes two mm. two <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Where's the other half coming from? Oh, I thought you. I thought you were going to say I'm going to be charitable. I'll count it as one. But okay, no, no so it's one, one and a half. One and a half. One and a half. Yeah. One and a half. So move. by that metric, then I'm leading the race in uh, in Camp Blood Angel Army because yeah. I have finished uh, one of my Stone Guard veterans. So how many is that now, George? So technically, that's two. Because I've done the test intercessor as well. So you're half a model in front of me. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> we had a, we had a little bet uh, to see if I could start and finish my Blood Angels army before James could even Well, I think at, at this rate, yard, so. we're looking at a five-year project. I yeah, think. I'm, no, I'm going to, I'm <laughs> literally, two going? All, all my infantry, all 60 of the six to 10-man squads uh, for, for the first platoon, I'm going to get them done in one batch. That's my plan. So, uh, so yeah, that's my plan. I'm going to yeah. batch paint them all. I'm going to get them all done. Because, do you know what? One thing that was really surprising, actually, is unlike sort of like Marines, um, they're actually very quick to paint the, the old metal guard models. There's not like What's the sizing like on them, like compared to new stuff? Uh, they're smaller than the, they're slightly smaller than the plastic old Cadians. So, okay. so that, uh, and once you- By got, today's standards then, tiny. Mm. Yeah, they, do you know what? They look really good next to a Primaris Marine. It looks like the exact size difference you would have like in yeah, the real between, world, like between yeah, just, yeah. humans. Are they smaller than the new Cadians? A little bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, they are. Yeah. But it's, it's quite funny because the bolt pistol he's holding like in his hand is like, I mean, if you put a picture up, you see it, but like the bolt, pitch, bolt pistol is like, is like, it's like massive. Like, and it's an old bolt pistol. It's like huge in his hand. It's like, yeah. So it's like the, the BFG from, from, is it? That's from Doom. Doom. That's the from one. Doom. There we go. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know how I didn't realize that. I used to play Doom all the time as a kid, but never mind. Um, so yeah. Um, but that's, yeah, that's my hobby update on a long winded Mordian tank update. So okay. yeah. I can't imagine painting that many, getting through that many tanks. I can't wait. Can't wait. It's weird that he, one thing I will give James credit for, he sort of thrives in the chaos because yeah. most people would be going, Oh my nightmare god! Nightmare situation. Yeah, for most exactly. People, yeah. I just for some put... reason, he's like in this pocket where, like, unless he's got an overwhelming amount of stuff to do, if I give you one model to do, it's not going to happen. Yeah, no, <laughs> but yeah. if I give you like four hundred, you're like, nah, give me two I, weeks. Just yeah, the I love uh, it. I'll batch paint sixty in one go. What? Yeah, but <laughs> but they are really they are genuinely like the detail on them is so minimal that mm. like it it it's the progression through the batching stage that is really quick. It's really really quick. But yeah, but in fairness though, you've done that many of more detailed models than that you've batch painted like 40 odd it was 40 well. for the, yeah. The, well, the yeah 40 of the blood angels for the heresy project yeah, yeah. that yeah. was that was that was a bit of a grueling task but yeah big numbers yeah 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 big numbers paul what are paul. you uh what have you been up to hobby -wise? Let's, let's talk about your painting paul because because <laughs> like obviously like the, the the listeners and viewers i've had a little go yeah, yeah. i think you've got to give yourself a bit more credit than that like you like how long have you been? How long have you been painting miniatures? To give give everyone watching and listening a bit of a bit of a give us the cliche us, hobby story. Yeah. Of well, how you done okay. it in your childhood, and then you grew <laughs> up, and then you discover beer and women, and then you stop. <laughs> 
that's pretty much it. Pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, next, next. Yeah. Now, let me take you back to uh, the dystopian decade of 19, 1980s. Uh, well, I, I sort of got, got into it in around about 1985, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think that's when I first did my first Spitfire. <laughs> Good start. <laughs> Solid know, start. Airfix yeah. kit. I think that's when I, my dad was into model making. And so, you know, just the natural progression. And what else was there to do? Then? I mean, I had a stick, <laughs> but there wasn't much else to play <laughs> and do back then. So, uh, yeah, I got my first model kit. My dad took me to get my first model kit. Spitfire, classic, done that. At massive respect, straight yeah. away. Uh, Spitfire, Measure Smiths, all those old classics, you know, hanging from the ceiling. T- that total cliche type thing, for the, especially for the 1980s. Um, and then from that, a, a few years after that, I started to get into, you know, the old fighting fantasy books in Livingston mm-hmm. and things like that. So just kind of drifting more into fantasy realms and things. And then I found Games Workshop. And then from that, fell into a rabbit hole of just forever grey shame. Yeah. Well, it wasn't grey shame back then. It was, it was just white metal. Yeah. There was a few plastic kits. There were a few plastic kits, yeah. But yeah, so that's how I got into it. And then I got my few my small friend group into it so that I had people to play 40k with. So you were the instigator. I, I was. Yeah. Yes. I was like the, the uber nerd king <laughs> of my little, my little clan of friends. Um, they're all nerds anyway. Yeah. But I mean, it wasn't back then. It you wasn't a public thing that you could say that you was a you was a into war game before being a nerd. No, was cool. Nobody before, runs down the street shouting yeah, space marines now. Oh, okay, okay. So you don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, so that's how we got into it. Uh, we yeah, we heavily got into forty k. Yeah. Um, but as we this sort of our early teenage years, and as we sort of getting a bit older exams and things were coming up. So mm. we then progressed into games like Necromunda and Blood Bowl just because you needed smaller teams or, or gangs and things. And you could you could do have a game in an afternoon or an evening and not the whole weekend like we used to do for 40K. We used to literally go around to my friend's house, take over the entire living room, turf his parents out, <laughs> and put an eight foot by four foot board on the floor. And, you know, the four of us would sit around it with 2,000 points each or you know having a great game over the whole weekend yeah you know so that's how i sort of got into it that's great um and then i sort of got more into the painting side of things Mm -hmm. and gradually weaned out the gaming part of it yeah over the years just because of you know time money and other commitments and things so so now i'm sort of at the stage of oh that's a nice shiny new model i'll paint that yep Rather than committing to any sort of one faction or game system or anything like that, I just paint whatever I fancy. <laughs> so, what have you been painting uh, of late then on that? On well, that I, like, I painted a Don- painted Dante a couple of weeks ago. I'm not going to say anything. So, I just because I thought it was a cool model, so I'll grab that one and paint that one. But now, Harbinger of Decay. Oh, what a model! So, uh, George it, George loves that model. I, it took me a while to get hold of one because. GW have never got any in stock, so yeah. I had to go to somewhere else to get one. Is he available on his own now? I think yes. he is, yeah. Yes, I think he, he is, is yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So I managed to grab hold of one of those, and I'm working that my way through that. a phenomenal model, isn't it? Like, love, it's just great. It's just yeah. a brilliant model. Fantastic. Yeah, love it. Yeah. So I'm about halfway through, I would say. Yeah. Because yeah. you, you painted the one we went done one for preview. You painted yeah, we preview, got sent one uh, kind of by GW when it came out and mm. I painted that one for uh, for the preview. Yeah, it's good it fun. Was, yeah, very fun. Amazing model. Like, it's just got, it, it, there are the models that, those models that just get released that you look at them and it's like, that is just going to be like yeah. an iconic model. Like, it is so good. Right? Yeah, just to, to paint it and just have it on the shelf. Doesn't matter, you know, if you're a 40K player, doesn't matter. Just get one and paint it. And, I remember and, I remember they announced that at Warhammer Fest, actually. Mm. And it was in the article. And I remember seeing it and just instantly on the spot, like the first time I saw it, I was like, oh, yeah, that's just going to be one of those models that you yeah. see all the time at competitions. It's a competition. Somebody yeah. said to me, that's a real painter's model. Yeah. I think that's, yeah. they're right. It I is, think that's kind of like AOS in general these days, isn't it, with the characters? Yeah, I think they're mo- all, the, all the models in AOS are like, they're, they're just like, I, I love 40K, but the AOS models are phenomenal. They are just amazing. We've yeah. said it time and time again, yeah. but it yeah. does seem like the painter's like, side. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, I mean, it's so sort of fantastical, sort of characterful models. Do you, do you know what it really reminds me of that model? You know, you know the scene in Lord of the Rings where I know exactly the, the, what the, you're going to say. Hobbits, the hobbits are hiding under the thing. Yeah, yeah. It, I would yeah. love to see like a like a fantasy or Age of Sigmar parody of like 
Well, they do that. Forge World do that as a yeah, as no, a no, they, armor, don't they? yeah, yeah, they do. They do the Lord of the Rings one. But what I'm saying is, you do the Nurgle one on like a bit of a mound or hill, and then underneath it have like some 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 nurgling, some hearts, <laughs> so heart, no, 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 you, some you like grots, little, like grots or, yeah. or, or Gretchen or something. That's even, all or I can Nurgling's. see That'd every time amazing. I look at that model is is that scene. Do you know? It, yeah, I think it's because of the way that the steed is kind of like posed and the way he's kind of like turned slightly to the and left. He's sort of and looking down a little down. bit. It yeah. really reminds me of it like massively, yeah. but I, it's a really cool, it's an amazing model. He just looks like, like a ring wraith anyway, doesn't he? It's, it's with a, a massive scythe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be hiding, wouldn't you? Yeah. yeah. So that, yeah. Just a quick one. I wanted to let you know that you can get your own miniatures painted by the world-class team here at Siege Studios. We offer a variety of painting levels and services to meet your needs and budget, whether you want a centerpiece character or an entire gaming army. We offer well above the industry standard of quality and experience. You can learn more about our services and get a quote now at siegestudios.co.uk. And just for you podcast listeners, you can get 5% off your first commission with us here at Siege using the code PAINT5. Now back to the show. Uh, should we do some uh, listeners' comments? Yeah, shoot. Okay. Uh, Chris Mason says, Hey fellas, love the podcast. Just caught up with the brushes episode and have some thoughts. One way to preserve brushes is to use an old brush to move paints from the pot to the palette and thin them with. Also, if you have a color, uh, mix it with that junky brush as well. Um, I pulled this comment out because that is exactly why I love the dropper bottles, as we all know. <laughs> uh, so if you want to just skip the middleman with your brushes, just put all your paints in and just, spe just spend the small investment of 36 to 48 hours of your <laughs> of your time transferring all of your paints into dropper bottles, potentially losing out on a load of paint. And uh, you'll be off to the races. You'll save, you know, tens of brushes over the course so, of 100 so years. So while you're not wasting 36 to 48 hours transferring paint, you could be painting miniatures yeah. and just transferring yeah, another paint. Another one paint. other Blood Angel painted. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. What can I, say? <laughs> I actually do that. I do this as, as well. I've yep. got an old, tatty old brush. Yep. That I just use for moving paint around. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly same. what I'm saying. Yeah. Just, uh, just further on that as well, it goes on to say, uh, my other thought is that you spend 20 minutes talking about uh, brush sizes and how it varies. No argument there. Uh, but later you arrived and talked about your workhorse brushes, uh, but we never mentioned what brands we use. So uh, hmm. just to clarify on that. So I was saying that I use a size two at the minute. My main workhorse brush uh, is a Rosemary & Co. Series 33 which matches up pretty similarly to uh size. I think we said size two yeah. artist Oper series S. Didn't yeah, we? it was yeah. pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. They're very, very close. Um, so, so, so do you, do you mainly use Rosemary and co then typically Are they the main sort of brushes? It's that not you use? like out. It's because I, it's, it happens to be what I have at the minute, like yeah, most yeah. of, and I've been pretty happy with them, but I've jumped ships a lot. I was first proper Kalinsky brushes I used was Raphael 8404s. Then I jumped to Windsor and Newton series sevens, but they're very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. Uh, then I went back to Artist Opus, used them for a while. Then I found Rosemary & Co. I've tried some few other ones here and there. And now I kind of use a mix because I've still got like some held over from before. So I use a mixture of Series 7. Mm. I've still got some Artist Opus brushes. Um, but yeah, just in terms of size, I just wanted to just go over that because uh, they asked. So yeah. yeah. Uh, Knights says, literally sat here painting Raven Guard while listening to this episode. Oh no. But at least I have an endless stream of tears to now thin my paints with. We rocked the boat with the, uh, with the 10 Raven Guard fans out there, didn't we? I will just maintain that I did not want anything to be in D. Okay. I was <laughs> fighting the fight and I saw someone else's comment. I don't know if you pulled it out or not, but I was fighting the fight for a lot of chapters because I was like, I just can't put them in D. Um, I think there was some others that were here that were a little bit more brutal than me when it came to, yeah. to, to choices. Well, obviously that was all in uh, good fun. I'll rate it. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah. I think we we'll definitely do some more of those. There's been a, yeah, a, been a few, quite a few people suggesting that we do some more of those uh, yeah. rating game. Paul, you watched that episode. Did you have any, did. Uh, did you find that yes. our, hate, our takes were a bit <laughs> too hot for you? <laughs> I, I, I thought that there was all spot on. I mean, <laughs> this is where Paul, Paul it, fundamentally seals the deal by going, yeah, Raven Guard are definitely deep. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I agree with that, actually. Yeah. No, they, no, they're definitely D. Yeah, no. Um, I, 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 was, I still maintain that I think Iron Hand should have been a bit, bit higher, but we'll just... Well, the rule was we all had to agree. Yeah, and, it was uh, very much you know. so. Yeah. Uh, Faces and Bases says, brilliant show. I'm totally with George on the basing here. You often see uh, bases representing armies on their home world or specialist terrain, never taking the fight to the enemy. Hmm. I personally think a warmer base uh, would frame Space Wolves much better. And also cheers for the heads up on the competition advice. Well, that's good. It's good. I hope the competition advice helps. It's, it, I, I'm, 
a massive advocate of competition painting that whatever level you're at, I think that it's something that when you're in that combined, a combined situation of I've got to be really good, got to be clean, got to be sharp, got to be neat, whatever method of painting you apply, as well as here's a date I've got to do it by. I'm not the best for that. I'm still painting hotels, but yeah. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I think that just helps fundamentally improve your painting hugely. Um, um, bases. Um, this was in relation yeah, to, I was talking about, this, oh, just for context for the listeners, if you didn't catch the last episode, I was saying how, uh, with Space Wolves, you always see them on snowy snow bases. bases yeah. Yeah. With, and there were, like I said, there would be, there was a bunch of people saying, my Space Wolves aren't on snow bases. There's, but, there's, uh, fair enough. But that, my point was just like, it's strange that some factions have like an associated basing scheme that they're kind of always with. It's like Joe said as well, like Salamanders always have like the, the lava basing. Mm. I just found it interesting. I don't necessarily disagree with it, but it was a uh, food for thought. I think it's a bit of a, a bit of a, 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 not a Marmite, but it's a bit of a like, 50 50 kind of thing like whether you want them to be thematically themed to their environment they're naturally in or you know i, I mean there's a really good bit of armageddon artwork um with like a, a stomper and some orcs and stuff and there's uh a, a space wolves thunderhawk flying over and you've got some sisters of battle and space wolves on armageddon fighting against the orcs and they're on like that sandy kind of like ash waste kind of thing and they do look really really good um again it's just situational isn't it you just put your army in the world or in or battleground that you want them to be in so yeah. i suppose quite an easy way to stand out if you was looking for like how could i make like my space wolves unique i guess would be to maybe go the opposite route or put space get... wolves on a lava base oh yeah, that, that, yeah. That someone's so i'm sure someone's done it and then you could glaze sweat onto the forehead <laughs> take the pelt off and <laughs> put the pelt on the floor they'd be on fire yeah, like yeah oh brilliant uh, they're not always waiting for things to turn up on their doorstep to have a scrap, are they? They're no, always, no. You, you get deployed where they get deployed, don't they? So, yeah. You know, yeah. Space Wolves in the jungle, why I, not? I really want to see Space Wolves on a lava base now. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm just imagining like Ragnar, there. he's like, oh, this wolf pelt. Oh. <laughs> so hot, yeah. <laughs> this is not the vacation I was promised. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> discards the brochure into the lava. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Okay, topic for this week. This is going to be how to level up your painting. So we've spoken to a, it's quite nice having you on the show, Paul, actually, because we get a, an alternative perspective from people who are maybe in different parts of the hobby. Yeah. I don't know a lot of the listeners are maybe a bit earlier on in their journey or they're looking to start taking the next steps into getting a bit more serious about their painting. So mm. um, I thought we'd talk about the steps if you are a beginner or you're someone earlier on in the journey. We've done one for intermediate painters as mm. well. Um, if you haven't listened to that episode, go back through the catalogue, you can find that one. Um, but we're going to be talking about, yeah, how to how to level up your painting. Yeah, so so you, you've obviously been here with us for about two years or so now, Paul. So like in that time, obviously, you've seen lots and lots of models every day mm. coming in, obviously, from all the team and the team produced that Adam paints, et cetera. Like how how have you found your painting over that time period and before that? Like talk to us a bit about more like how you've kind of like leveled up in your painting and things you've kind of like learned through what you've seen or what you've tried. Well, I, I mean, that, I did have a, until I, I've only started picking up the brush again about a year ago. Mm -hmm. So I've only sort of been painting again for about a year. And before that, it was about 10, 15 years since I'd oh, big done gap. any painting. So I had a huge gap. Yeah. The beer know. and women gap. Yeah. Well, the, yeah. And, you know, <laughs> it's in the army and everything else and just general life and everything took place. So guns, beer and women. <laughs> <laughs> guns, beer and women. You should have said that from and, the beginning. Uh, <laughs> you know, Travelling the world and doing all the other stuff and that sort of thing and houses and whatnot. Anyway. That's besides the point, right? <laughs> so now I've, I've picked up the brush again. And um, although some of the muscle memory is still there, yeah. um, it, it, comparatively to what I was painting in the UK, it was kind of like starting again. Right, and the okay. hobby's changed. The hobby's changed quite a bit since I last did any painting at all. You know, when, uh, like when I picked up the brush a year ago, it's all about the old speed paints and um, contrast and things like that. So... And then working here, how can you not, how can you not get back involved with it? I'm completely surrounded all day long. You're smothered by it. With yeah. <laughs> either like the stuff that GW sends us that we get to have a little sneak peek at or all the, the, the custom sculpted stuff that our, the, the, the sculptors send us, all the, we got like all the artists, I'm bombarded all day long with um, all the awesome stuff that people paint. And I think, how can I not just get, you know, I, I promised myself when I started, I was like, I'll get one little model at a time and I'll paint it. <laughs> I love the pause there because you know the pause I, means. Because I know <laughs> it's not happened at all. No. Like, every sort of month I think I just get, I just get one more and I'll definitely paint the one that I'm halfway through finishing now and then I'll 
start that one. So how bad, the first question I've got to ask, yeah. how bad is the grey shame one year I've in? I've got way more than I, <laughs> <laughs> I should have in a year for any normal person to have. I'm not quite at your level with 30 no, tanks and yeah, stuff. That's, but that's, the, the, no, 30 tanks that we know about, Paul. Yeah. I'm sure there's more. There's, Shh, there's no more. But there, there is a steady pile in the corner of the living room that's growing out of control very slowly. Um, Just for context quickly, what, do you feel... Where was your painting at sort of before the gap? Do you feel that... Well, funny enough, back back in the... When I used to work for... I did used to work for a game workshop a long time ago, very briefly. Um, and was I that did, in one of their retail stores? Yeah, yeah, just... And I did enter Golden Demon mm -hmm. two two years in a row, you know, a long time ago. So, you know, my painting back then was good enough to enter competitions. Yeah. Um, now, I feel like I'm sort of back at the beginning again of... A, like a painting journey with more knowledge than perhaps someone Somebody who is just really is just starting. I suppose that's a weird spot to be in really. There's kind of something similar that Joe sort of echoed when um, yeah. he said with starting, kind of like you said, being surrounded at all the time. Joe's saying about how he's kick, kicked it off again because of being on the podcast and having to talk about it every yeah. single week because it's kind of hard not to. But I guess it's kind of the same thing of having this like yeah. being around it and speaking to experienced people so much you're kind of like getting yeah. the expert tips or well that's the down. other thing as well because obviously like you know George James and Adam in the same room as me everyone's sort of painting and doing things so if I don't know I always say to Adam I say, oh that looks interesting how do you uh, how do you do that and what's your recipe for that so and he's always uh, and he's I guess for context for the, the listeners as well I guess if you're in that sort of spot like surrounding yourself with like podcasts like this or mm. joining uh, like Siege Studios Discord group and like surrounding yourself by other people who are maybe further along the journey than you so that you can you know, ricochet ideas off of them or get some feedback from yeah. them, that sort of thing. Or even just like, just that osmosis of just being around it like as much as possible. It's I guess. not like always what you know, it's who you know as well. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I mean like what for you since obviously coming back, you said obviously you started about a year or so ago. So you've been obviously working for us for a year already, but like from the point of going, right, yeah, I'm really going to get back into painting. Like, mm. What, what for you has been like the biggest thing for you that's like been, all oh, this, this has changed or this is different from how you, what, what for you is, well, I, I think like when I was saying like using contrast paints mm -hmm. because it, getting back into it it was kind of a bit like well okay I've got some models but I don't you know it's being surrounded by all the cool stuff that I see every day it's a bit intimidating to see these things and you think <laughs> well so I need to ease myself back into it so I picked up some some contrast paints mm -hmm. and, I, and I have to say um, using those really helped with building back up my confidence again mm -hmm. in just picking up a brush and putting some paint onto a plastic model. Mm -hmm. um, kind so of breaking the ice. Like, yeah, yeah, kind of yeah, that little, that seal of, you know, just having the confidence just to pick something up and just slapping some paint, getting the, like they say, like the muscle memory back in, you know, because you, sometimes you can picture something, but you can't always, that doesn't always translate down your arm onto the end of a brush, does it? So, um, so yeah, for me, that was, that was sort of key getting that first sort of stepping stone back into the hobby what what was it for so the thing with contrast paints is that they're they're great for like all kinds of levels like you can use them at real high end for like subtle color uh, like color sort of changes or mm. glazes or tints and things like that all the way through to like when you just as you said i just put it on to give you that confidence and that muscle memory but yeah, yeah they are and it's really good to hear that you've kind of like you, do, you, do you still obviously some time has passed in your painting since you've got back yeah. into it do, how have you I'm going to assume, and obviously correct me if I'm wrong, that you've moved on to maybe using some more just acrylics and things like that. Like, do you still use them quite a lot? Or yeah, do you... well, it, it kind of sort of progressed from using contrasts, only using contrast, and then using contrast, and then there's this like contrast plus type painting. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Way of painting. So then I would add, like, use the contrast as a sort of a base color. Mm -hmm. um, and then that helped me as a guide about where to put highlights and things like that. So after doing that, I've kind of progress especially when we did i did the multi-factor mm -hmm. uh space marine for for siege you know we did the little example chapters yeah, yeah, yeah it's on screen now for the listeners so um i did that and i totally stopped using the contrast after that so and i used the, i think i used the sponge for that it's <laughs> all right so got rid of the brush got rid of the contrast Did, the didn't do a day with the blood effects just <laughs> flicking blood all over the model yeah just got the, <laughs> the, the sponge off the kitchen sink yeah, yeah. Do. brilliant um so yeah, I did that, and then I sort of progressed a bit more from that to the Dante, mm -hmm. which was a bit more involved, obviously. Mm -hmm. And then for my Harbinger of Decay, which has taken me a good 
long time. It's just it's just nice now to be able to not rely on the contrast mm -hmm. to get me through. So now I'm sort of progressing into like triads, color triads, and sort of working with that, working my way through that. So I know, you know, this this green robe as needs, you know, the base color, and then I'm doing a couple of highlights. So which has been been helpful. So. You put it to me the other day. It was quite inspiring to hear, actually. You said, I've, I've decided to grow up with my painting. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> a... <laughs> but that's, that's interesting, though, because it means that like, you saying that to me kind of vocalized like, this internal switch that you flicked. It's, like a, it's a conscious decision. It's not mm. just uh, mm. evolution over time, if you get what I mean. I think you can actively decide, like, okay, today's the day I'm going to Yeah, And there is a massive difference between what I'm painting now to what I, even to what I was painting six months ago. And I think that's just because, you know, it's, I've made sort of a conscious effort to sort of say, well, okay, I'm not going to rely on that so much now. I'm actually going to do this mm -hmm. instead. And uh, the difference in the, the quality of painting, mm -hmm. um, even just practicing with doing my edge highlights and things like that, because that's a big, that's obviously a big part of the miniature painting. Mm -hmm. So, which I was never very good at, but, um, but now, yeah, it's 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 kind of, it's moving along nicely. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy where I am at the minute. So. But I mean, the, the, that much difference in six months is like is yeah. is a massive thing. Like that's like you know that I don't think. Obviously, I know you had the the period of time before, and you had the big gap of fifteen or so years or whatever mm. long it was. But then, like going from picking up a model first, using contrast the first time, and, and getting the 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 confidence you're using it and using a brush again, to then six months later being like doing tinted metallics on like that Dante model that you showed mm. me and now I could pick a really super detailed Harbinger and Decay model and then just you know to have that kind of progression in that kind of time frame is, is, yeah. is still it's still well, mega I think, big, like, I think a lot of people would be surprised at how much you can improve if you put down the YouTube videos and stop watching and looking out for the next like cheap quick easy yeah. fast way to get better mm. and you put down those videos and you say to yourself consciously, I'm going to try to get better. I've got these five models in front of me. I'm going to paint one. I'm going to look at it. I'm going to assess it. I'm going to work out what I need to improve on. And you actually consciously practice that yeah. over the course of a few weeks, you will see massive gains. And yeah, in my opinion, huge. far bigger than any like one tutorial of like some method or some weird reimagining of slap shop can teach you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, I, I agree totally. I mean, you, you said a lot of the things, obviously you went from, you kind of, it's really interesting because you started painting with contrast to get that confidence using a brush again. You've then obviously gone on to doing like, I think you said contrast plus, which you really like, you start using acrylics to do edges and bits and bobs yeah. like that. And then, then you reach that point where you just switched and went, right, okay, I'm going to go to yeah. pure acrylics. So now. now I'm at the point where I've got, I've got a nice sort of stack of contrast paints at home, but I haven't really got any of the other paints. So I'm thinking, well, I need to buy these now. So I need to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, need... I don't really know the best terminology for it, but you just the, the paint shame. I think is probably the. You might way. be the only person on earth that has this. To yeah. like That I I really want to one day. We're gonna have to like go and look for all of your paints because I think you might Welcome actually have some record. <laughs> yeah. No comment. Yeah. 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 I can't really comment on that. Paint um, is one thing. But I've... no, I've got plenty of um, bits in the old bits box to practice on. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't have to build a whole model just to practice. Well, that's a the perfect thing. That's something so. I heard about a long time ago. And actually you've just reminded me of that. Cause I don't really think I've heard of it since is like all these extra bits you've got rather than having them sat in a box, like waiting for the yeah. kit bashing phone to ring, Like you've got <laughs> loads of stuff you can practice on. Cause people always talk yeah. about how they're, Oh, I'm afraid to paint this. Or I've just bought this like army and I've built all, oh, but I'm scared to paint it. It's like, I'll tell you, you've got like loads of stuff left over, loads of extra parts. Yeah. I'll tell you what's good for practicing edge highlighting on as well. Just the sprue, because it's got sharp edges all over it. So <laughs> That's a really good thing. So, yeah. That's just, a really, you know, really no, good I've thing. I've never heard anyone say that. And that's yeah. a really good point. You know, just yeah. painting edge highlights on a bit of old tatty old sprue. So. That's amazing. Paul's dropping the painting hack, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. uh, like, you, could, you should have saved that for the hobby hack. Yeah. I'll save that for later <laughs> so, in the episode. Yeah, I'll save that again <laughs> in about five minutes. Something. Yeah, that's brilliant. That's a great thing. Like, you know, because um, uh, a lot of us obviously just chuck the sprues away or, you know, they, uh, on a slight weird off tangent, I saw that GW is starting to recycle sprues as well. Oh, are they? That's good. So that's quite a good mm. thing. But yeah, if you don't want to recycle them, just cut them into yeah. into lengths and just practice doing yeah, edges got, on yeah, them. That option's there. Yeah, that's you good. No, that's, that's a really interesting thing. I've never known anyone to do that, but that's, that's really good. That's awesome. Big news. Tickets are now on sale for the Siege Studios painting classes for 2024. 
For over eight years, we've been running in-depth, hands-on classes across the UK, which has allowed us to create the perfect learning environment for improving your painting skills. With a variety of topics available, all our courses are taught by senior artists and feature practical demonstrations in a relaxed environment that welcomes interaction from you, discussions on theory, and an open Q&A session so you can ask that burning question you've had on your mind. You can even bring your models for feedback. To book now and reserve your place before tickets set out, head over to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop. I'll see you on a class soon. The interesting point for me will be whereby you obviously you flip now to just using just acrylics. Mm. And then obviously you'll undoubtedly look to contrast again later on in, in, in painting and go, I'll just use a tiny bit of that. And then maybe I'll just boost the color there a little bit with it. So it'll be interesting when you kind of repick them up. And it's then funny start... how contrast paints kind of come full circle. Yeah, they do. Point, yeah. Don't they? yeah. Yeah. Like a lot of people, there's a lot of stigma with them. And like, and I think that there shouldn't be like, you know, they, they, they're amazing paints for lots of variation, different executions. I think so, a lot yeah. of people were hesitant when they were first announced as well, especially people that were already confident painters that like this was sort of going to come along. And I guess, the worry was it was going to kind of devalue what people are doing and people were kind of like myself included actually to an extent kind of like afraid to try them because it was sort mm. of like i don't want to bring myself down to that level but i, mean, I find the contrast paints are tremendous and you can use such, mm -hmm. you can use them for such advanced techniques it's kind of silly to disregard them i guess or to look at them as they've only got this one flavor of i can you know slap it all over the model because I, I know that is what they're sort of advertised as, as like an entry point but they are like really useful for panel lining, recess shading, airbrushing really nicely. You can use them for glazing volumes. Mm. I think they, uh, they're also really good for, for, not everybody likes to paint. Lots of people just want to play the game and not, not do any painting or, you know, just find the whole process of putting paint on miniatures too much. So these are a great way just to like spend 40 minutes slapping some paint onto sort of a squad or 10 timber and they're good to go. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. it's really good for that sort of thing. Yeah. And perhaps, you know, maybe in a few months after you've done that a few times, you, you get the confidence to perhaps do more. Again, we'll get, again, sort of go to the next stage, maybe. I think as well, because you'll be seeing like nicer results by doing that with less effort than if you were just like base coating them, for example, yeah. uh, with like normal acrylics. I think that might have a higher likelihood of, because if you're someone who's completely new and you really hate painting, and you've got to paint this army and you sit there and you base coat it and you find it really grueling and they don't look maybe as nice as you want to at the end of it. If you were just sitting there with some contrast paints, pretty low effort, they're going to look quite nice, especially at like for gaming at yeah. like table distance. If you're doing that and you're seeing the results and they actually look quite good, it's probably going to give you a bit more of a feel good feeling and make, make you a bit more likely to actually want yeah. to progress with it, I guess. Yeah. 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 James, have you had any like a uh, sort of light bulb moments with like maybe earlier on in your painting uh, journey where you sort of consciously decided to, improve or to practice or to level up your painting so so i um I'll, I'll be open about this like when i was a kid i used to eat sleep breathe white dwarf and the box box art that used to be my, my used daily. to eat white dwarf you've heard it hurt Not first <laughs> that's how you consume the knowledge i don't know yeah. if you're aware you need to you need to eat, eat the, the white magazine, dwarf as well yeah. yeah once you finish reading it tasty snack very nutritious caveat i've never eaten a white dwarf um <laughs> um but no yeah so i used to literally i used to I remember as a kid, like I'd go, I'd go to bed fairly early as a kid or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I, I'd stay up and read and I would literally have that month's white dwarf every single, like maybe by my bedside, like as a kid growing up, like, um, and it, I, there were, there was a point in my painting where like my painting was, I mean, the, the, the example earlier of the second model painting is an example of that. Like it, my painting was nowhere near what I used to, used to look at day in, day out as a kid while growing up and, you know, and, and stuff like that. So, so I, I suppose it, there's like a, modern equivalent of that is like the Instagram being the white dwarf. It the, is you know yeah, very I mean? much yeah. so. Yeah, very much so. Um, and, and there was one, there was one, and I remember this like it was like, like it was Yes, I remember oh, there was one evening as a, as a child where I, I'd bought, I remember buying it. It was the, um, the metal blood angel squad. So you got the metal, blood, it was where they had plastic arms, and metal torso, and metal fine, torsos. Yeah. Um, and I remember buying the sergeant, the the blood angel sergeant from that from that box. He had this weird like Game Boy on his hip. There's like a sculpted Game Boy thing on his hip. <laughs> I remember. Uh, I do I'll remember find, that. Kit. I'll find it. I'll find a picture yeah. of him and we'll put it up. You can see the Game Boy on the hip. Um, and uh, and um, I painted him as the first model because it's like the model I really like from the squad. It's a sergeant. Yeah, it's like the leader figure from the box, or whatever. And I remember literally it was, and I've said it multiple times before. I've used this analogy, but like it's that Homer Simpson barbecue moment, and it was like it was it was like well, there's mine. Why doesn't it look like that? And I remember just sitting there as a kid in the evening, just looking at it and looking at what I'd done and then looking at the box art and then looking at the, uh, looking at the, 
at the, the model and going backwards and forwards. And I remember just literally just trying to extrapolate from what's been done on the box to what I'd done and how it had been and trying to mm. work out like the magic, what how, the formula how, was, what, how, yeah. how it was done. And then like, I think from then onwards, that box for me of those 10 models literally was the thing that we've spoken about where you said get get a box and then what we spoke about in a previous episode i don't remember the episode number so i'm not going to do a joe and quote the correct, correct number but <laughs> but but like i remember getting that box and and literally working through it literally just looking at the cover art and then painting a bit on the model and trying to get it as close as i can to to what's on the box if that makes sense mm. and what we said on the episode as well was painting models individually yeah. and you paint one and you finish it and then you paint the next one using the first one as a reference, mm -hmm. making note of all the mistakes, the things you want to improve, painting the mm -hmm. second one and so on and so on and so on. Yeah. And, that, and that's literally what I did with that box. Um, and I remember I, I must've been, I can't think how old I was then, but I must've been at least 10, 11, something like that. And, and I remember that, that was a moment where <clears throat> my painting didn't like go crazy, like better, but there were incremental growths and, and betterments within those 10 models because I was literally just taking each one individually and, and I thought to myself right well if I if I just try and paint this one as close as I can to how it is on the box and the problem with it on the box this is where it was a real problem back in the day is that you can't zoom in well you can't <laughs> zoom in and also you can't see the back of the model so because you just were the prints like good quality yeah the box, I guess the the box art yeah. photography pretty been, much yeah the yeah, box yeah. arts were really good I mean look photography obviously has come on leaps and bounds since in those days but but like when you're talking like the early nineties or something like mm. that, like, but, but, um, yeah. And it was literally just a case of like, well, I have to kind of make up what's on the back of the, of the model. Cause I don't, I just paint it as best I can with thinking how I, and that was quite good. I think that's a really good actual thing. Like, um, for just for a painting perspective of stuff, but like if you, if you, you know, in those days I had kind of, it created a bit of, uh, creativity for, for as a painter because you're like right well I don't know how the back's painted or what color that detail is because something would have grenades or would have like a mm. totem or like if you think of the space or metal ones they used to have loads of stuff all yeah. over them so like you couldn't really you couldn't go on a website and do a 360 you couldn't no. do any of that kind of stuff so it wasn't even a thing then was it, it wasn't no so 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 literally like that that for me I think really helped me because I was like right well I'm going to try and do the best I can as close as possible to how it looks on the front that I can see and then on the back I've got to keep keep it as good as the front, but then I've got to make up all the choices and do everything mm. so that it doesn't look like box art and then and then <laughs> trash. <you know>? So <laughs> I like, just don't paint it. Yeah. It's kind of like that's amazing in a, in its own way though, because it's like, okay, you've practiced what we've shown you. Now go and try it for yourself. Yeah, you know that's what I mean? very much that's very much what it used to be like. But but I think that's the one thing that really helped me is because I had those 10 models, the first one, and I wish and I remember getting to like fourth or fifth one in and I'm being like I wish I didn't paint the sergeant first because when you start seeing those <laughs> your little, excitement got the better yeah, well yeah because yeah. when you start seeing those little tangible increases in, in like refinement or quality or you, yeah. you you do that little detail and like yes I've done that detail like it's on the box or something like that and then and then I remember looking at the sergeant and going oh I just wish I hadn't done that one first you know and I think that's the thing so so yeah so maybe as a future thing another model that I'll try and redo is that is that is that metal sergeant because mm -hmm. I, I love that model um, so yeah, but that's, that's kind of the thing, the big takeaway for me was like, was just focusing on, on looking at stuff and going, right, I, I just need to really refine down how I'm looking at stuff. I think that's the best way to do it in my mind. But yeah. Yeah. It's we're actually luckier that now, because there's so much reference mm. out there to use, to help you out. You can get drunk on it. You, yeah. There's, yeah. 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 Whereas back in, you know, the nineties, when we were sort of second edition of things and we were doing all that sort of stuff, you had a, a piece of slightly fuzzy box art and perhaps a copy of G, you know, uh, White, Dwarf, White yeah. Dwarf, if you were lucky to, yeah. look, to look at. And that was it, you know, unless you could get to the local like Games, Games Workshop, Workshop store yeah. and speak to the guys there. But uh, most of it was either, you know, don't, even, paint, even don't paint it or make it up. Even Joe pointed it out, like in a pretty about that ethereal that he painted, because but he had there was an ethereal like a limited edition one from like fourth edition or fifth edition, I think it is. And he, I remember when he we went to Warhammer World one time for the company, we were going through the museum, and uh, he 
photograph oh, the reflection in, yeah. the, in the cabinet so that you yeah, could see because there was, no, back, there was <laughs> yeah. no rear of the model yeah. it, was, it was almost like back in second edition like yeah. in, I think like, he said 90s. that there was a mirror behind it yeah it is yeah so all the cabinets yeah. are mirrored mm. so literally yeah. he photographed the reflection and the mirror so then he can go home and go oh that's how the back takes it and then paint it like yeah um yeah, but you do what you got to do. You do don't what you, you got to do. Yeah, um, but yeah, going to your local store back in the early nineties was like, was really the way to kind of like maybe see how like the store manager would paint. Yeah, it, or like, see or, what they had in the cabinets because most of the time they had the newer models painted yeah. and put in. Yeah, put and in the, the store cabinets. manager ninety ninety plus percent of the time the store manager was a really decent painter. Yeah, you know, and like you you know you could always ask for advice and stuff like that. But yeah, that that was the thing for me. I think that box that I remember it, the Metal Blood Angel, my Blood Angel Tactical Squads. Um, was the one box that I really kind of like started to try and push myself on. So it's really interesting because your painting like length, the time you've been painting is like, it's really, because I've been painting obviously a long time. Paul has painted a long time, but he had a massive gap. And then you've had this like, don some swim trunks and jump head first in. <laughs> and you've been doing it for a couple of, obviously a couple of years. So in the time frame that you've been painting, what, kind of like what for you has been like the massive takeaway the thing that's really made it click and, and kind of go right way so i spoke about this on the first episode of this podcast so sorry og listeners you will have heard this before but for everyone else Tupperware. <laughs> yeah. so when i i'd been painting for quite a while and i was this is fast forwarding sort of a couple of years actually i was already commissioned painting and this is when i came to work for the company mm. and on my interview here i saw that um Primaris captain that was painted Harry by, Potter. by Matt Kennedy in the Harry Potter color scheme. I'll put it on now. The Slytherin the, one. Yeah, yeah, it was fantastic. And I was so inspired by that model. And I, that was literally, it, it's so vivid and so clear to me. And I've never had any other moment like this in my life. I know it sounds like ridiculous, but that was probably the most like obvious time where I actively just went, I'm going to do that. Like I was mm. so sure in my head. I was like, I, some, something about that, like emotionally just made me go, I need to be able to paint like that. I don't care how I get there. I don't care how long it takes. I want to be able to do that because mm. that's mental. So <laughs> <laughs> that that day, I went home. I bought the exact same model. I found the the photos online that Siege published. And I literally, kind of similar to what you said, actually, okay, it's kind of a modern version of it. I sat there with my model and I analyzed like my painting style and how it, because I was already doing like the edge highlighting, but back then I was painting with a lot more airbrush and I wasn't nearly as refined as Matt is. I'm still not, but I consciously like sat there with the images like blown up on my computer and I just very methodically went through it and compared what I was painting to that and really zoomed in. And this is, I still to this day love analyzing other people's work because you can, if you spend more than 30 seconds looking at a model and you actually really deep dive and analyze how it's been done and try to reverse engineer in your head what you think they've done like with the brushes mm -hmm. on a sort of micro level. And I, I sat there and I worked out the sort of methodology of the, the chunky highlight, the thin highlight, that heavy metal style. And I sort of reverse engineered it and I painted that model from start to finish. And I got, at the time, I was like incredibly like proud of myself and really chuffed. It well, was- the jump, the jump was was mega. Like yeah. between, between, I mean, I'd obviously seen your portfolio when you joined us and, and like, you're, you're a good painter. Like there's nothing wrong with your painting at all when you when you joined us. But like the progression just in that was, was, was crazy good. That's like, the biggest jump I've ever had in my painting was not this like overtime thing. It was literally- between the model that I last painted before that model and that model, that gap was massive. And it was, it was massive for my improvement. I'm, I'm not sure how relatable that may be for other people, but I hope that you can take from that, that if you do sit there and you analyze other people's work, I've spoken about this before on the podcast, but you can learn so much from that mm -hmm. and just consciously practicing and not just mindlessly going, oh, I'm going to paint it similar to that. I'm going to use the same colors. It's like, no, how have they highlighted it? Like you don't need to know the exact colors they use, but just the, the mind the mindset and the thought process of it, even if you put it into black and white, just working out like the values, the jumping color, where the highlight placement is and sitting and analyzing that, that was massive, massive jump for, for my improvement. And while I would like to think that today I've improved a lot more since then, cause that was going back a few years ago. And if I was painting now, I'd like to think I could maybe hopefully get a little bit closer, but the, the jump between what I was doing before then. And, and that was, was really important for me. Yeah. yeah. Thanks to Harry Potter. Yeah. yeah. Good job we didn't see that. Was it, didn't you do some bacon marines? Oh, don't. Point? Yeah. They, good job yeah. we didn't see those. Yeah, good job we didn't see those. Yeah. <laughs> a different story completely. Yeah, completely different. I think what it was, was you show, I actually saw a lot of other like very impressive models that day that I had a little tour of the studio. But I think because creatively it was so impressive, it was this, it clearly been like come up with on the spot, but yeah. the quality of execution was as if it was anything else, if you get what I mean. It was, it so if, you, if you'd have seen a Blood Angel painted amazingly, 
you've seen a Blood Angel before. Yeah. So yeah. yes, you look at it and you go, oh, wow, the painting's amazing. That's kind of as far as it goes. But because this was, like no one else has done has done that as far as I was aware, like Harry Potter Space Marine, it was crazy. And yeah. like just looking at it, I'm like, oh, this is Slytherin. Like it's obvious, like the per the color choice, like the purple yeah. sort of burgundy, had Draco written on the, and that was Gun. the first time that I'd seen a scroll on the weapon casing, like painted yeah. in such like high quality as well. It wasn't like a scribble on there. It's like this mm. like, gothic font. It looked, it looked incredible. And it was just so creative. And now know more about the story and how the client just sent this, uh, was it like a meme photo? It was, it was, the there was literally yeah. two photos. It was a, it was a picture of um, Snape and it was like a bit of canvas or material like for color. Yeah. Um, and that was it. Yeah. Literally. And then like MK from that just extrapolated all of it. Like, Things, little creative decisions like putting this the Deathly Hallows symbol on the knee pad and stuff like that. Like it's just and the, like Draco on the on the on the gun scroll and stuff like it's stuff like that that really adds a lot of kind of like value to a miniature. It's not just the quality of the paint job; it's the it's the creativity and the thought mm. process that goes behind it. It's a personal thing as well, yeah. isn't it? They're each everyone's army is personal to them. It's like there. It's like there. Yeah. It 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 literally it it you're quite right it's got that really good amalgamation of a really really great paint job and at the same time it's got this depth of of, of richness to it in the creativity as well which is just mm -hmm. yeah good so i can totally understand why that that specific piece captivated you as much as it did because it it, it was something very very special that we done you know yeah um, and so, i hope what the listeners can take from that is and from this episode as a whole to be honest is consciously deciding to improve is a real thing mm -hmm. it's not you know i understand that sometimes you get inspired and then it's sort of you listen to this episode and then you go away and you sort of go back into your old ways. But if you do sit there and you really do try and you do analyze your work and you do put the work in, like I know this is a hobby and people want escapism and you want to paint for fun. And I totally respect that. If you don't 100%. want to have these like massive existential jumps in your painting, like that's perfectly okay. If that's like what you enjoy, then mm. more power to you. But if you do want to make that jump, you know, with it and with anything, like if you do actively decide to do that and you do put in the practice, I think you'd be surprised at how quick you'll see the gains. It's not like I'm saying, do this for six months, you know. Yeah, it it will it will have massive massive impact. Hmm. I think I think you do need to draw the line in the sand and, and and just make that conscious decision and go right. I I because that is how it was for me. Like the moment because I felt like I'd ruined that model. Like hmm. because I was like, oh, it doesn't look anywhere near like it like it does on the box, and 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 it and it bugged me as to why it didn't. And that I think that bugging of why can't I do it and why can I not get it to look like it. That for me was the Kickstarter, which made me think, you know what, like I need to do, I need to, I need to do this. The same way with yourself, like when you saw that model, you're like, I need to, I need to get to that point where I can do that. Mm. That was exactly it for me. Like, cause I was, I was, I remember I was so frustrated at myself. I was literally like, <laughs> why can't I do this? Why, why, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I stare at these models, at these pictures in the magazines and these box arts. I stare at them every night, every day. And I go in that I, you know, my, my parents used to take me to Lakeside. I used to go shopping around Lakeside and they just like, Lots of kids do when they're young. They get left in Games Workshop, obviously, just to just to obviously as a crash. As a, as a, yeah, I I, I was that's, that's a shopping you know, centre, yeah, by the way, yeah. for anyone outside of Essex. Yeah, so yeah, so it's, yeah, Lakeside's a shopping centre. So so um so yeah, and I used to spend just dumped in the lake. Yeah, I, so, <laughs> yeah, let's go shopping. so I used to spend hours just in there, just probably annoying the annoying the staff, and and just literally just looking at box arts and looking at models in the cabinet, and then I'd come home and look at mine and be like, oh, you know, and that I think that was kind of like what fired me up and was like, right, I've got to do something about this because I can't, they're going to kick me out of the shop if I keep staring at the boxes. I need to be able to paint that way. So yeah. Um, yeah. It's a bit like a whipping the bandaid off, isn't it? Real, it is, it, yeah. Like just whipping it off quick and just make it like you say, making that conscious decision to perhaps leave something behind and take the next step into something else. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, I, I always, always say it like you've got to, everything that you just said about that model and like things that you've said about models that you've done, it always points back to the thing, which I, I do say a lot about, which is that fear. And that's that false expectations mm. of is about pushing yourself outside that comfort zone. Because the moment you do that, you're in uncharted waters. And the yeah. only thing you can do is sink or swim. And when it's those two options, you'd like to think that most of the time you'll always push to, to be the swim option, you know? So, so yeah, that's the way that I look at it. But, mm. but yeah. If you're enjoying the show and you want to get even more painting tips and techniques from us here at Siege, head over to our Patreon. With the Siege Studios Patreon, you'll gain access to a catalogue of over 250 PDF and video tutorials covering a variety of techniques from our foundation tutorials to full character masterclasses and much more. We also have a tier just for you podcast listeners to help support the show. So if you want to take your paintings to the next step and make the most of your hobby time, head over to patreon.com forward slash Siege Studios. 
question of the week time. Thank you everyone for submitting your questions for question of the week. If you have a question that you'd like us to answer on the podcast, please leave it in the comments down below on YouTube. Or if you're listening on any of the audio platforms, please fire us a DM on Instagram, either at Siege Studios or at Paint Perspective Podcast. Uh, this week, we have a question from James who says, do you and or would you varnish gaming versus display models? I, I would definitely, definitely varnish gaming models because mm. you spent however long painting them. And we always, one thing I just want to say in the studio, everyone understands model etiquette, which is to move the model by the base room and not by the model. Like when you're gaming and you get a bit excited about the charge you've just made or the, the war boss you've just killed in glorious combat or whatever it is, <laughs> like there is a habit to pick the model up by the model. Um, and it's just a, it's just a, that you're in the moment. You just, oh, I'd move the model, blah, blah, blah. you know, it happens. Um, and if you are repeatedly doing that time after time, after time, after time, then unfortunately, like just the oil in our skin and stuff like that. And the abrasion just can wear paint off. And I think it's a bit of a shame when you spent that much time, which you're not going to get back on these beautiful miniatures or the models that you're really proud of. And then you are manhandling them inadvertently without thinking about it because it's just a conscious decision an, an unconscious decision of just picking up the model. Mm. Um, on the flip side of that for competitions, I actually don't varnish a lot of my competition stuff. Okay. Well, that's interesting you say that because I do and I don't. I'll, I like varnish for its like properties beyond protection, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So varnish is magic at deepening blacks, making blends that seemed not smooth, smooth, because now everything's got this uniform finish. You haven't got mm -hmm. this glossiness where you've been adding water. Mm -hmm. And you've got varieties of varnish. You can have the, the gloss varnish, which you might want to put on like a gem or make something look wet. Mm -hmm. You've got the like ultra matte varnish, which you might want to make something look like old and tattered, or you might want to put it on a surface to dull a transfer so it looks like it was painted on. I use varnish quite a lot in my competition pieces, but thinned down and applied with a brush carefully for like their effect. Whereas when you think about it in a gaming context, you're thinking about, oh, okay, I want to protect the paint job. Hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah. I, uh, oh, go on, you go. I yeah, well, no, it's, I mean, I don't sort of paint for competitions or paint for gaming, <laughs> I, any of either of those things. So, but I've always varnished everything. Mm -hmm. Just, I don't know. It was kind of always sort of drummed into us. Finishing process. Just the, yeah, it's the last mm. thing you do is just whack a coat of varnish on. Um, normally just matte varnish, obviously, unless you've got gems and whatnot and things, but mine just sit on the shelf. So I, I, I sort of, I'm hoping the varnish protects them from dust and and that sort of thing as well. I'm, I don't know. I've always varnished everything. Mm. I mean, for, for gaming, I always have, um, just because obviously of that reason. Um, competition, the reason I... I have, I kind of have, and I haven't. Most, mostly haven't. Um, purely because some varnishes do do change color hue. Sometimes, or make, not change the hue, but they can sometimes make it look like more vibrant or desaturated. Example, for example, like matte can sometimes kill the vibrancy of a color. Sometimes, um, and gloss will obviously sometimes can exaggerate the saturation of a color. So, I, if I've got the color exactly as I want it, I'm I don't like changing it, which is the reason why I don't do a lot the of fear varnish. yeah the mm. fear exactly that yeah yeah um except my expectations are real because then i go <laughs> oh it doesn't look as bright yeah or whatever but um but yeah um i, I some things i have like um there have seen some pieces that i have varnish that i've entered um specifically one just off the top of my head my, my yarrick model for our iron skull competition a couple of years ago i did because it was metal and i was like right well you know i've painted all these colors and tones and things onto it and just in case anything happens i want it protected and i want to obviously just give it a concentric finish as well. Um, Do you not find that it like smooths all of your blends out though? Like, cause you're seeing mm. when you're like, for example, with like a cloak, when you're glazing and you're thinning paint down, especially when you're adding like other additives like glaze medium, whatever, it will have a different finish mm -hmm. to the rest of like maybe your shading or mid tone or the base coat. So do you not find that when you're varnishing stuff, it ties everything together and it, regardless of, I understand your apprehension about like color, like changes, but do you not find that that's sort of offset by the benefit of it looking because you've put all that hard work into glazing the transition and it is there. It's not like you're faking it by putting the varnish on. It's like, no, it is there. It's actually made to look worse than it actually is yeah. mm. because of the finish. Yeah. I mean, yes, uh, that there is that benefit. Definitely. Um, I kind of, it's, it's, it, it's kind of two sides to it. Like one side of it is like, I, I think by not, I don't want to use the word relying cause that comes across the wrong way, but by not varnishing it, 
it kind of puts you in a position where that transition has got to be as seamless as physically possible. Hmm. So like if there is a part of it that you're like, oh, you know what, I can probably, if I varnish it, it'll probably just soften it a little bit or whatever. Like hmm. I, I have varnished stuff that I've blended and I have varnished stuff that has been entered or whatever, blah, blah. But I think for me, I, I've always lent heavily on just trying to get it visually as it is, as, as good as I can, if that makes yeah. sense. Like um, One yeah. thing I've actually done as well, sort of going back to earlier in the show, when we talked about like practicing is um, AK do this stuff called uh, ultra matte varnish. And it does not lie. It is ultra matte. It is <laughs> very matte. Right. matte. <laughs> Clues in the name. They're not, they're not kidding. But um, I found that when I've been practicing stuff, putting that ultra matte varnish over it to emphasize any mistakes that maybe wouldn't be visible because of when you're like looking out under your painting lamp, mm. you've got like a little bit of a satin finish, a little bit of a glossy finish. Mm. I found that there's been some stuff that I painted. I've been like, oh yeah, this is brilliant. Like, this is fantastic. What a good job, George. Well done. <laughs> Ultra matte. Oh, no, this is terrible. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so, I've, uh, I've seen it used for that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, it's, I do like Ultra matte. I think it is really good, especially for certain things, like, for example, specifically, like, things that are, uh, like, tanks and stuff like that, because you they you want them to have more of a matte kind of finish and not reflective and stuff like that. I think it's really, again, Ultra matte is really good for, like, more for historicals and if you're doing, like, vehicles and things. It's also great for busts as well if you've got some, if you've got, like, skin tones and things like really nicely blended skin and all that kind of stuff. It's also nice if you mix in with your paint, you can actually add a tiny little bit, and because it's quite thick, yeah it doesn't thicken up your paint or anything mm. and if you've got a paint that's a little bit glossy or a little bit more satin than you want you can actually just add like tiny little brush full just into your mix on the wet palette what about brings things back down selective varnishing whereas you say like you know perhaps you wouldn't varnish the whole model but perhaps a cape where you'd mm. use it to blend would you just varnish the cape just for that well that's what blending I was talking, property that's exactly what i was talking about with my mm. like competition pieces so that's mm. um with some notable exceptions for example with my black templars that i done for golden demon last year them being black Black has a tendency to look quite dull and grey once you start highlighting it because it's yeah. got, especially if it's like a very matte finish. And I was using the VA Home 950 Black, which is very, 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 very matte, matte very as matte. well. <laughs> so just adding a little bit of not, you know, sometimes like a matte varnish is sold as a matte varnish and in your head you're like, oh, it's a little bit satin. Kind of that, mm. like not quite satin, but not quite matte, yeah. like kind of that middle ground. Um, and like I said before, like I'll, I'll put it on uh, some cloth textures just uh, just to help tie the blends together. But I wouldn't I wouldn't treat it like I would a gaming model where I'm like, oh, finished. Let's gloss varnish the whole thing. Yeah. Matte varnish the whole thing yeah. just for some protection. Yeah. yeah, like the thing you said about glossing gems and stuff like that or lenses or glass and stuff like that, that also helps. Again, because it just helps sell the material property mm. of that object yeah. as well. It's kind of like additional free contrast because you've got contrast of color and contrast to finish. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's gonna mean like uh, we're not gonna come up with some new new acronym tactical tactical varnish stage TPS. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, but yeah, put that in the lexicon. <laughs> lexicon. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, but yeah, no, I I think that again, selective with it is quite cool. Um, so yeah, that works. I, I I the the thing you said about capes is quite interesting. You could put like a really good kind of like kind of like half matte, half satin kind of finish on it to give it like a velvety kind of finish. Or matin. Like matin, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. You can do the opposite yeah. as well. You can like ultra matte stuff to make it look like flatter uh, as well. Yeah, so you're going for true. like a worn texture or something like that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm. I can see the cogs turning in your head. Yeah, I'm starting <laughs> yeah. to think about it already. Yeah, like, it's good. Yeah, yeah. No so more. I'm quite worried about my harbinger decay. I don't want to put matte varnish on it and it tones it all down. Depends how vibrant you've gone with it as well. Like, and also you've got to think it's Nurgle. So like, mm. would it be very vibrant or would it be more... I'll be honest though, in my new, experience, new I've never, colors. even even going back to what you were saying, I've never really found that, maybe it's just the products I'm using, but I've never really found that when I varnish stuff, it changes the color. When when I've created, had transitions, like when I'm on, on classes and stuff, when we do like transitions on doors, sometimes if you hit it too heavy, sometimes I've seen doors that have been hit too heavy with, with matte, you kind of lose a bit of the transition yeah. because it's just, it's it's literally got rid of any kind of like. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. I believe it. It makes sense. Yeah. I'm just saying it's not something I've personally experienced. And, being and honest. gloss does make colours look more vibrant because it's that, 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 that sheen. I have found. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. so, so not that I'd ever gloss a comp piece and stick it in, you know, but like. Never say never. Never say never. <laughs> <laughs> never say never, yeah. Yeah, but. It's um, so vibrant. Yeah, it's so That's vibrant. It's like it comes in Ray-Bans, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, so, yeah, but no, um, yeah, it's just interesting actually. Yeah, it could be with different ways of, of applying it, but yeah. Okay, hobby hack. This is our little closing weekly segment where I share a hobby hack with you. I feel like we've splashed a few in the last few episodes, or bonus been, throughout. Yeah, but uh, mm. we, we've got Paul here. Paul's uh, ready with his uh, yeah, my little his quick tip, my little take on things. So I, I suppose, especially now, I'm trying to become more disciplined in what I do mm -hmm. uh, with my painting. Um, and in previous years, um, I just pick up a brush and just go at it. 
and not really have much focus, you know, paint a pouch here, paint a foot there, paint this over there, paint that, you know, paint all sorts of things, paint his fringe, paint that, you know, whatever. Right. But, but now like I've just had to grow up with my painting. I'm starting to make, um, which is a lot, lot of sense is to have small goals, sort of kind of real simple goals that are easy to achieve during my painting and make a plan make a little plan before I pick up my brush so I know what I want to achieve on that little painting session and actually how I'm going to go about doing it. And um, I have to say, it's, it's, that's also really helped me with my painting and getting things, actually getting things done. Mm. Because, you know, I don't like batch painting. If I have if I had 60 Mordians to paint, I'd only paint them one at a time. <laughs> and it would take me forever. But, um, but, uh, but now give myself small, like easy, easily achievable goals. Like oh, today I'm going to just paint, like my Harbinger, I'm going to paint all the skulls today with all the bits of flesh that are still on them. I'm going to paint those and, and then I'll write a little bit of how I'm going to paint them. And that's, I think that's, that's quite a good little thing to go away with. Um, going from chaos to being sort of under the emperor's wings. <laughs> <laughs> so having, having a bit more more structure with what you do you exactly yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah that's better that's yeah. a better word for it <laughs> having some sort of structure and not being total chaos being in the uh... no one likes a heretic Paul come on <laughs> <laughs> just because you paint no doesn't mean you have to live it <laughs> <laughs> that's the best bit. that's the best bit but, um, yeah. so yeah I think doing that um, even beforehand I never even used to write down how I paint things so like you know i Especially like even last year, painted a lot of Death Guard because they're nice and easy to paint. You haven't got to worry too much about what you're throwing on them. But sometimes I think, oh, what did I use to paint that with? <laughs> and I've completely forgotten. But now, like, you know, I'm, I'm actually being a bit more disciplined, like I say, and writing things down. So now I can think, actually, I, I know I need to paint another skull. That's how I painted those. Mm. Yeah. This is how I can do that. So I love that because that's kind of kind of like what uh, me and James spoke about the painting journals is kind of like on the opposite end because I love a retrospective like after I've painted mm, yeah and that's kind of what I've started doing with my um, my Instagram posts lately is I kind of use it as an excuse to collect my thoughts and I try to sort of write for myself like a little paragraph kind of about the process and what I enjoyed yeah and I like doing that sort of retrospective to unpack things but I love what you said and that ties into an episode that we've done previously um, about like setting painting goals and getting the most enjoyment of like going in with like a nice achievable yeah plan in before a session of like here's what i want to achieve by the end of it kind it's, of ensures that you're going to be satisfied especially if it's something like really digestible as well yeah it's almost like in the evening when you think oh, i fancy watching a movie going onto netflix not really sure what you want to watch spending an hour thumbing through it and not w watching anything mm. so it, it's you know before you, before i even sit at the desk my little painting corner in my house and uh you know, getting on with the painting is actually thinking about what i want to do first mm. And not spending that time sat there going. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're I'm not doing anything. So. No, you're, you're right. Next yeah. so the time will fly by, and you will, you, will, you won't achieve much. And then I'm you're... actually I'm getting a lot more done in a focused amount of time. Yeah, you can actually achieve quite a lot in a small amount of time if you're more focused on what you're doing. Yeah. Uh, Cool. Well, we'll leave it there. Uh, thank you, Paul, for coming on the show. And thank you, everyone, for listening to this week's episode of Paint Perspective. If you could please do us a huge, huge favor. If you're watching on YouTube, please do subscribe to the channel because it helps us bring you these episodes every single week for free. And if you're listening on iTunes, Spotify, or any of those other audio platforms, if you could leave us a rating or a review. That would help us out absolutely massively. Please check the links in the descriptions for ways you can support the show as well and find links to our website where you can get a quote for commissions from us. Thank you, everyone. We will catch you next week. <laughs>